Are the Sussexes plotting a Hollywood comeback? Why will William and Harry have a near miss later this year? And what is going on at Balmoral this summer? Well, stick with us to find out more. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Joe Elvin and here to discuss the week's big royal stories is royal author and broadcaster Victoria Murphy and the Daily Mail's diary editor Richard Eden. Welcome to you both. And a reminder that if you like royal videos featuring the finest experts, make sure you subscribe to our channel and never miss another episode of Palace Confidential panicking at the thought of that. Now, our Rebecca English is on holiday for the next couple of weeks, but we are going to kick off the show with a piece she wrote about the first summer in Balmoral without the late Queen. We'll put a link to that below. Victoria Murphy, it's been a long time since we've seen you. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Um, one of the many interesting things that Rebecca wrote about in that piece was that she, uh, Andrew will be invited. Yes, that's what she wrote. I mean, it was a, a really interesting piece, covered lots of topics. Um, but, you know, I don't think anyone who's followed the royal family for the last year will be surprised to hear that Andrew is going to Balmoral because we have seen him make appearances with the family over the last year. He's been, he walked to church at Sandringham on Christmas Day. He appeared at the East today service he was public at the coronation so this idea that he's completely disappeared is no longer the case they're clearly working towards having him present during family moments what they're not doing is putting him on the balcony having him at the center of any big official moments or any official photographs but I think the idea that he's going to be moral the idea that he's involved in this family experience is not that surprising, I don't think. Do you think people will be at all dismayed by this, no matter what the context? Well, I think the interesting thing is that they, they're sort of reading the room on this as he appears, because a few years ago he wasn't appearing walking to church with the royal family at Sandringham. But last year when he did, there was an overwhelming outrage that drowned out every other narrative, and similarly with the Easter service, and also similarly with the coronation. So they clearly are getting to this place where he can do certain things without that being the dominant story. Mm. Mm. Richard Eden, coming to you now. First of all, did you have a nice holiday? Um, lovely, thank you. Yeah, did you, refreshed. Uh, did you not consider the Edenites desperate for their weekly fix? I, I still wrote so my selfish. newsletter. I still wrote my newsletter, <laughs> you know, from, from the beat. So I, I don't neglect my um, readers. The outrage, the crying in the streets. But he's back now, everybody. Don't don't panic. But now back to back to business. Some might be surprised at the fact that the king and queen they'll, they'll be up at Balmoral for a, a long time over summer, but they won't actually be staying there very much. Yeah, this is the slight um, caveat to Rebecca's piece, was that, um, so yes, Prince Andrew may be invited, um, but first of all, he's been made to wait, because he, he always used to go at the start of the summer holiday, um, but um, King Charles extended the opening hours to the public at Balmoral for another couple of weeks, mm. so he's been made to wait, um, and if there is that invitation, um, it may not be to um, the big house. It may not be to the castle. They could stay at Craig Owen Lodge or another of the properties. But also, King Charles and Camilla probably won't be there anyway. Um, because, Where will they be? So they'll be at Burkhall, which is also on the huge Balmoral estate, but it's there very much home from home in Scotland. <clears throat> and it's been made clear that they, they want to continue keeping that as their base. So Yes, they'll be going across to, to Balmoral Castle to, for example, entertain the Prime Minister and all this type of thing. But it will be more like a sort of meeting place rather than their, their home. Victoria, my um, tiny, feeble mind bred in the colonies can't quite compute how many houses these people have got. <laughs> I mean, with, with fewer working royals than ever, the sheer number of properties they have becomes even more you know, it, it comes into sharp relief, doesn't it? No, completely. And this is, I think, a big challenge for them, a big PR challenge, if nothing else. And the fact that Charles and Camilla are staying at Burke Hall, not at Balmoral, is just reflects this abundance of properties that they do have. One thing I found really interesting since Charles came to the throne, which has gone sort of largely unremarked on, is that when he... The, the royal standard that flies on the top of Buckingham Palace when the monarch is in residence flies on Buckingham Palace when he is in Clarence House now because they're treating those buildings as one estate. But when the Queen was on the throne, they didn't treat those buildings as one estate. You know, Clarence House was Charles's, but he's not giving it to William because William has Kensington Palace and William also has another home in Windsor, which he took on without giving up either Kensington Palace or Anne Hall. So they have this absolute abundance of official and private residences. And I think... 
there's going to have to be a plan moving forward for how to manage this because the next generation of royals are not going to come and take those properties and have residence in those properties for many years. George is only 10. And so what are they going to do about, about all of this? Are they going to open them to the public for longer? There's been conversations about this. There's been lots of suggestions that Charles would do this, but absolutely nothing concrete that is changing so far about the openings of Buckingham Palace or any other royal residences. So I think this is a challenge that they do need to get to grips with. I mean, a key thing to say is that Balmoral is a private estate. You know, it was bought yeah. by Prince Albert. So it, it <clears throat> remains in the family. They're not using taxpayers' money or anything like that. And King Charles inherited um, Burkhall from his beloved grandmother, the Queen Mother, you see. Maybe King Charles could use it as an incentive to Prince Harry and Meghan to come back. He, you know, he could say you can have a, a lovely holiday home in Scotland and give them Burkhall. But I don't really know how much of an incentive that would be. Is that a pig just flying past the window, <laughs> Victoria? Did you see that? I just, that is not going to happen. <laughs> but I want to yeah. go back to what you said about Clarence House. That is uh, new information to me mm. about the Royal Standard flying there mm. as well. Mm. I had no idea, did you? Yeah, no. I noticed it over the funeral when Charles had left Clarence at Buckingham Palace, but the Royal Standard continued to fly, and I asked someone about it um, and have observed it since as well. So uh, you... We were talking before about maybe the renovations. I mean, that's something as well. If Charles isn't able to use the palace and the private apartments in the way that you would when the renovations aren't taking place, but he goes to Clarence House instead. But yeah, it's interesting. I mean, look, viewers of um, you know Netflix show The Crown will remember how. Um, Winston Churchill, you know, made the point he put Queen Elizabeth under a lot of pressure to move into Buckingham Palace. Yes. You know, Prince Philip had just, it was his pride and joy, he just renovated Clarence House and wanted to stay there. But Churchill said, no, the royal family must be in its traditional home at Buckingham Palace. So what you're saying is the entire royal family thinks Buckingham Palace sucks and they all want to live at Clarence <laughs> House. Is that it? Well, I think it's complicated <laughs> by the fact that there's major works going on. Yeah, so yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, Clarence House has until this generation always been a residence that belonged to a different section of the family. So when the Queen was on the throne, it belonged to Charles, it belonged to the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret as well at one point. So it's been, it's it's always been held by someone else and it, it isn't now because William, the next generation down, has Kensington Palace. Oh, phew. Well, Thank yeah. goodness which, for which that. Which was renovated at extreme, uh, huge amounts of taxpayers' expense. And so if he was to walk away from that, again, that would be controversial. Well, let's go to these uh, the, the poor Sussexes who only have that one house in Montecito at the moment. But uh, we're, they, we've discussed they're very unlikely to be seen in Balmoral, Balmoral sorry, anytime soon, despite an apparent open invitation. But in this piece, Rebecca English does, however, quote a source saying that there is a sliver of hope within the family that relationships can be rebuilt. I mean, I think there's always a sliver of hope, isn't there? <laughs> oh, but it's <laughs> such a sweet thing to say. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the royal family has has shown us that time is a healer. We've really seen that with the royal family and the rehabilitation of Charles and Camilla's reputation and the relationships there. So I, I don't think you can ever say never to there being a reconciliation in the future. And I think particularly with Charles and Harry, because this is a father and son, and I actually don't think Charles came off that badly in spare at all. I, 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 I don't think his reputation was done, got that much of a knocking from it. It was mostly William who Harry pitted as the villain and in that, that book. broken necklace. Yeah, and so so I I think it could happen. I think between the brothers, more unlikely. Yes, Richard, that does seem to be the hardest one to reconcile, doesn't it? Oh, come on, I mean, you talk about a slither of hope, but there, there might be, the only hope there could be is that um, that Harry and Meghan apologise. They say, look, we're you know, really, really sorry for all the damage we've done and we'd like to make amends. But unless that happens, I, I can't see any kind of reconciliation. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll talk later perhaps, but if you look at all the, the new sort of propaganda coming from California propaganda. this... Propaganda. Uh, propaganda coming from <laughs> California this week, you'll see there it doesn't really seem to be any sign of that at all. We'll, we'll stick around for that, viewers. But um, also, uh, Richard, there will be a near miss, apparently, won't there, between William and Harry later this year in 
Singapore. I love that their lives are so itinerized that we know this already. Um, yeah, I mean, call me suspicious, but it does seem a bit odd that, you know, Prince William's had his long planned um, engagement in Singapore, which is the next um, prize ceremony for the Earthshot Prize, you know, great environmental project that he's involved in. That's in Singapore in November. And then suddenly we have this announcement that um, Prince Harry is going to be playing a, a charity polo match in Singapore later this month. So obviously a big time lapse between them, but it does seem curious. We'll have more on the Sussexes in just a couple of minutes. But for now, let's turn to your comments. Lots of you were keen to express your support for the Princess of Wales, who was dubbed a disappointment by one fashion writer for her jewellery choices. Wendy Donaldson says, and this is why the royals hold their own and have great value to the British people. Catherine, Princess of Wales, promotes small British jewellery businesses, help the economy, while Tony Swift enjoyed the exchange between the king and queen after Camilla found a pie that had been modelled on charge, deftly pointed out by our Rebecca English. She writes, I loved it when Queen Camilla spotted the pastry, giggled, and then told King Charles to take a look. The lady has a great sense of humour, and personally, I think she has been wonderful for King Charles. And we have a question from Loves a Puzzle who writes, thank you for the Balmoral montage. Are the plaids worn by the royals significant or are they just the ones they happen to like? Victoria, plaid expert, what can you tell us about the royal tartan? I believe tartan played a part in your wedding. It did play a part <laughs> in my wedding, yes. Um, my husband wore a kilt when we got married. Um, love kilts. Um, and there is a significance to the tartans that the royal family wear sometimes um, they wear different tartans but the ones that they wear a lot one of the most talked about ones is the balmoral tartan which i'm sure you guys have heard of um, and that is known for being a tartan that only members of the royal family can wear or the piper to the sovereign can also wear it apparently it was designed by prince albert um, and it is worn by the royal family when they go to Balmoral, quite poignantly was worn by the Queen during her last official engagement when she met Liz Truss. Oh, she was goodness, wearing Balmoral yes. tartan. Yeah. Um, there's also the Royal Stuart tartan, which is a red tartan. And that is the Royal tartan. It was adopted by the royal family um, in Queen Victoria's era. I think there was some kind of attempt to make that an exclusive tartan, but it failed because it was just so widely loved and worn by the public that it was just going to be impossible to ever kind of just have that for the royal family. But they do wear other tartans. Um, you will know, Richard, that William and Kate used to be known as the Earl and Countess of Strathern when yeah. they were in Scotland, <clears throat> when they had their previous titles. And she often used to wear Strathern tartan to sort of send that message when she was in Scotland. Well, Catherine did, but Prince William didn't. He's um, not keen at all on wearing kilts, Is we've um, been told. No. What about you, Richard? I have no um, Scottish blood, I'm afraid, and I've um, never worn a kilt. If any viewers of Palace Confidential <laughs> would like to see a montage of Richard Eden modelling various kilts, then do get, get in touch on the comments or email me at joe underscore elvin on Twitter and Instagram. Let's get that I think you'd look great, Richard. No. I think you'd look great. I'll stick with shorts. I love a tartan. Day. Love Brilliant. a tartan. Thank you for yeah. that education. It always amazes me how much there is to learn about tartan. Yeah. It's incredible. But... Um, now we're going to move on to Victoria, the new edition of People magazine, the American magazine that has landed. And on the cover, we have the Duke and Duchess of Sussex with the cover line, Harry and Meghan under pressure. Is this the start of them getting their side of the story out there? Well, I mean, I feel that they have had a lot of opportunity to get their side of the story out there. Uh, yes. We've heard quite a lot from, from them about their side of the story. Um, I thought one of the things I thought was interesting about this was that People magazine have been quite supportive of Harry and Meghan um, generally. And this is sort of a, a headline that you kind of does and a piece that does kind of talk about some of the challenges that they now have. And it, We've seen that in US media recently, in US print media, there's been a few pieces that have been quite punchy, um, some more so than others, but you know, kind of questioning what direction the couple are taking, whether they've made the right decisions. Um, and I think it sort of points to, I feel that perhaps what they have failed to do yet is to really kind of cultivate a really strong brand outside of the monarchy and something that means that they can go out there and that they're representing something other than just themselves in a meaningful way. And that's what they lost when they stepped back as working royals. They took away that substance that you get from representing this institution and representing a country, which is what the royals do when they go overseas. And 
it feels that they have, have yet to sort of find that core thing to replace it with. And if they want to be this philanthropic power couple with, with longevity, then I think that's what, that's what they need to find. Mm. Um, Richard, it's interesting, isn't it? Because normally they're not reticent in coming forward and correcting stories and, and commenting. And we think about all the stories about the Spotify deal going south and all of those things. It's surprising that we're only hearing from them now. Well, I think it's certainly connected to the fact that Megan's got this very high-powered um, Hollywood agent, Ari Emanuel, and my goodness, he seems to be earning his call. And I think they've, they've got several articles in People magazine, and, mm. and, and I say generally it's, you know, it's very um, favourable coverage. And I think he's, he's doing his best to sort of get things back on track. I mean, so, some of it, it's, it's really worth reading because it's, Frankly, I found it quite hilarious, but it's all these excuses for why things didn't work out with Spotify. Okay. And um, there, there, there were various ones that were given. It was that um, there was too much red tape was one of them. Um, too much red tape as in too much bureaucracy between them and um, Spotify. But you think, what red tape is there? It's bizarre. I mean, mm. they only need to kind of um, have these Zoom exchanges. Bill Simmons, their executive, talked about his um, memorable Zoom calls with Harry. Well, we're still waiting to hear the details of that, aren't we? Um, yeah, yeah, I really hope yeah. one day he does. He Get does, drunk enough, I promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does talk more. Yeah. Um, but it, it seemed to be no end of excuses for, for why it hasn't worked. Well, the, Victoria, the piece did point out that they still had a $100 million deal with Netflix and quoted an expert saying that perhaps the criticism of them and the Spotify thing was unfair when you compared them to other production companies. I mean, what, what do you think? There's no doubt that they have been hugely successful by general terms in what they have done. And so you could say, oh, was the bar too sort of high because of where they, where they came from? But then... Actually, the bar for what they were going to or what they wanted to achieve was high because of where they set it. You know, mm. they didn't leave the royal family and say, we're going to go away, we're going to live quietly, we may do one or two public appearances, we may do something. They went away and said, you know, we're going to create this whole thing of our own outside of the monarchy and we're still going to be this really public, really visible, really game-changing couple but completely on our own terms. They set that bar and they also set the bar for their lifestyle. You know, their the property that they live in is very expensive. They have this security that they feel it's very important for them to have. So they are the ones who are sort of trying to live up to their own expectations, really. Can you help me understand what, you know, I keep sort of like hearing about all their humanitarian goals and they've won awards for things. What, what, what are they doing? Well, I think that is what they need to either define that better or communicate that better because what you've just asked there is not a, a unusual question to hear people ask around them. And I think that's what the royal family can go off and do all these scattering things because they have this central focus at the core. They're raison d'etre, they're the monarchy, and that's what they represent, and people get that. And Harry and Meghan, I don't think, have either found that or communicated it properly yet. They are doing lots of, of different things, and they do, in some senses, fit into certain categories, so they're doing work. Women, um, Meghan does things around women's empowerment. Harry does a lot of work. They're doing things around technology and safer technology um, and uh, um, racial equality. But it, it, it's there's a lot of different things going on that I think perhaps are not connecting for people into one really strong message yeah. that isn't just about them as individuals. And because you, you've written, haven't you, in Town and Country magazine? What, what is this? tech project that yeah. doing. So I, I wrote about this this week because it was announced this week and so this is one of the things that they're backing, that their Archerwell Foundation is backing along with other people financially. They're providing a £2 million grant to these 26 youth-led organisations that are all working in different areas to improve technology to improve the internet to try and make it safer to try and make it a better place for young people all very admirable all things that you know the right kind of thing um, but it has got coverage and it has got coverage because it's one of it's the first time we've seen them in a while there's a video that's been released alongside that but there are times when I wonder would they if they were doing something like this from within the royal family would they be making more of an impact with the message around this that they're trying to make what, what did you mm. make of the video 
I thought the video, what, what was interesting to me was how it all seemed to be less about the projects and about sort of showing how marvellous Harry and Meghan were. So they would focus on the um, reactions of these young people who were um, in this call and they'd be like, oh, I can't believe I'm speaking to them and all this sort of thing. And, oh, it was a bit um, cringe making. I mean, I, t I think that's just me, but it, it really um, made me think, what, why are you doing this, this project? They were kind of explaining it and it sounded worthwhile, a useful project. But it, the video just seemed to be about we're here, we're great, and everyone loves us kind of thing. Mm. So it just made me slightly awkward. I oh, can't wait to hear what our viewers think of that. But I wanted to turn to a story also, Richard, that appeared this week about The Travelist. Yeah, Travelist is this um, is this project which um, Prince Harry launched, very much his project. He launched it with great fanfare. And it's all about um, sustainable travel, which sort of whatever that is, really. But is that, is that, I mean, yeah, it feels slightly like an oxymoron. But, uh, yeah, We're but, not going to stop travelling. So. But No, but I think it was about trying to sort of m make travel more environmentally friendly and that sort of thing. But what caught people's eye this week was that um, there was a, a big launch for their, their new venture. And Harry just didn't really feature at all. You know, he apparently his position hasn't changed at all in the organisation, but they just haven't emphasised it. And that that's made some sort of media experts and stuff say, well, you know, we think that's because he's not such an asset now, and that maybe they don't want to have the negative publicity that Harry attracts. Do you think that it does attract? There is the risk of attracting negative publicity. I mean, I I do feel that because Harry and Meghan have these enormous profiles, the position that people do. Take tend to take is that having that level of attention on whatever they're doing is is only a positive thing you know we're still talking about eyeballs on causes here um, and I mean he is still involved with travelists so it will be interesting to see if in the future he becomes more visible in that guise again um, but the, I mean when he was talking about travelist a lot a few years ago there was of course this ongoing narrative which did keep coming up which was about well are you traveling sustainably how eco-friendly are you and the use of private jets was something that came into that all of members of the royal family get that you know that William has received criticism when he's been talking about his homeless project and you know well you live in you're, you're a massive landlord now with the Duchy of Cornwall <laughs> and you live in, in several houses yeah and you yeah. just moved into a new house not that long ago so it, that that is you know the hypocrisy conversation is is there for all of them mm. But it's interesting if he's gone from being this great asset to actually, you know, potentially a bit of a liability. That's what is, is such a surprise. Yes, indeed. Well, on that note, it is montage time. And to celebrate the return of the Gillies Ball to Balmoral, we thought we'd bring together some of our favourite pictures of the royal family dancing. Enjoy. Those royals have some moves, eh? My thanks to Victoria and Richard and to you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.